Well, hello everyone, and welcome once again to Blogatos. I'm Phil Ramsey, and in this Bible Truth series, we go through the Word, basically chapter and verse, like we've said many times from the beginning. We're starting a new book uh, in this episode, which is First Kings, and it's always exciting to start a new book. You know, uh, like I'd said many times, reading the Bible is like um, getting to know a person, you know, getting to know God. It is His Word, and Jesus is, Himself is called the Word. And um, so, you know, you getting to know a person takes a long time and there are times when it's more interesting than others more exciting than others and so there are times in the bible and you and you see um you know ministers don't hit a lot of the, the places that are considered you know more or less exciting but you have to take it all together to really fully understand it and um so anyhow uh we are in the beginning of first kings um David is still alive at the beginning of 1 Kings, and is this the beginning of this book is the transition uh, of the kingdom from David to Solomon, and there's some things that happen that uh, challenge that. Um, let's go ahead and pray before we get into this. Father, thank you so much for your word. Again, I thank you that uh, you are present in your word, um, that you use your word to teach us and enlighten us and instruct us and correct us and uh, to guide us. And uh, I ask, Lord, that you would um, enlighten the eyes of our understanding, Father, as the Word said in Ephesians. You give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. Help us to understand this Word and how it uh, points to Jesus in every aspect of our lives. And I thank you, Father, and in Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. So in 1 Kings, I have um, one of the words in verse 2 highlighted out, and that's just for, you know, young ears. You can, uh, I'll just change that word and and then uh, also at the end of chapter 4, I have that last part highlighted out. Um, and then at the end of, <clears throat> at the end of uh, verse 2 in chapter 2, I have that highlighted out. And just in case we get to chapter 3, I have one word highlighted out in chapter 16. So uh, let's go ahead and jump in. I, I, you know, kind of eager to get into the word. So it says, King David was now very old, and no matter how many blankets covered him, he could not keep warm. So his advisors told him, let us find a young girl to wait on you and look after you, my lord. She will lie in your arms and keep you warm. Young woman of marrying age who's not married is the idea. Uh, verse 3, so they searched throughout the land of Israel for a beautiful girl, and they found Abishag from Shunem and brought her to the king. The girl was very beautiful. And she looked after the king and took care of him. And so she's only a nurse, only a caregiver. She's not a wife. She's There's no um, no romantic relationship. But she's just uh, only his nurse taking care of him. Verse 5, about that time, David's son Adonijah, whose mother was Haggith, began boasting, I will make myself king. So he provided himself with chariots and charioteers and recruited 50 men to run in front of him. And you know, remember... Uh, uh, Absalom did the same thing before he rebelled against David. He he recruited fifty men to run before him wherever he went. So there's a bit of like a, a like a replaying of events going on here. Verse six. Now his father, King David, had never disciplined him at any time, even by asking, "Why are you doing that?" Adonijah had been born next to, after Absalom, and he was very handsome. Adonijah took Joab, son of Zariah, and Abiathar the priest into his confidence, and they agreed to help him become king. And so if you remember, you know, Joab was the, uh, was the army commander who had done some sketchy things. And, and uh, he always did that when David wasn't around to see. Um, and then Abiathar was the priest that his entire family was executed by Saul. And Abiathar went and told David what had happened. And, da and this was when David was still running from Saul, back when he was young. And uh, he told him, Abiathar, just stay with me because the same person who's after you is after me. And so Abiathar was with David all those years. As a as the priest and and uh, but now he has joined uh, Joab and Adonijah in this conspiracy to make Adonijah king. Verse eight. But Zadok the priest, Benaiah son of Jehoiada, Nathan the prophet, Shimei, Ray, and David's personal bodyguard refused to support Adonijah. Adonijah went to the stone of Zohaleth near the spring of Enrogel, where he sacrificed sheep, cattle, and fattened calves. He invited all his brothers, the other sons of King David, and all the royal officials of Judah. But he did not invite Nathan the prophet, or Benaiah, or the king's bodyguard, or his brother Solomon. 
Then Nathan went to Bathsheba, Solomon's mother, and asked her, Haven't you heard that Haggath's son, Adonijah, has made himself king, and our Lord David doesn't even know about it? If you want to save your own life and the life of your own of, of your son Solomon, excuse me, follow my advice. Go at once to King David and say to him, My lord the king, didn't you make a vow and say to me, Your son Solomon will surely be the next king and will sit on my throne? Why then has Adonijah become king? And while you are still talking with him, I will come and confirm everything you have said. So Bathsheba went into the king's bedroom. He was very old now, and Abishag was taking care of him. Bathsheba bowed down before the king. What can I do for you? he asked her. She replied, My lord, you made a vow before the Lord your God when you said to me, Your own or your son Solomon will surely be the next king and will sit on my throne. But instead Adonijah has made himself king, and my lord the king does not even know about it. He has sacrificed many cattle, fattened calves, and sheep, and he has invited all the king's sons to attend the celebration. He also invited Abiathar the priest and Joab the commander of the army, but he did not invite your servant Solomon. And now, my lord the king, all Israel is waiting for you to announce who will become king after you. If you do not act, my son Solomon and I will be treated as criminals as soon as my lord the king has died. Well, why is that? Well, because Solomon is the heir apparent, even though Solomon is not the oldest son. And so, you know, going back, you know, uh, David's oldest son, Amnon, had died. Uh, his next oldest son, according to the, uh, the genealogy that we have in Chronicles, and I think it's also, you know, back there in Samuel, or Second Samuel, uh, the next son, son's name was Daniel, and he's not he's not mentioned in this story at all. Then the next son after that was Absalom, and he was the one who uh, uh, rose up against David and and caused a civil war, and and he is now passed away. And Ad, Adonijah is the next son, and so I've heard it say that that uh, you know uh, it, it taught some people say, well, Adonijah is next in line. Actually, technically, no, he wouldn't be next in line because the first son has died. And, and Absalom is, is dead, but there was another son named Daniel who was second, and he's not mentioned here. So Adonijah really doesn't have a, have a, um, a, a play here. He doesn't have a, a, a right to do this. And plus, that older son, Daniel, is not even the heir apparent. The heir apparent is Solomon because David, it, it's not necessarily a oldest son becomes the king kind of a thing. The, David a, appointed his successor, and the successor he appointed was Solomon. And so uh, this is why um, it would be um, dangerous for Bathsheba and Solomon if Adonijah became the king because Adonijah takes the kingship and then the heir apparent is still alive. That would cause problems. That would, that would create a potential challenge to his kingship. And so he wouldn't want that loose end laying around. So verse 22, while she was still speaking with the king, Nathan the prophet arrived. The king's officials told him, Nathan the prophet is here to see you. Nathan went in and bowed before the king with his face to the ground. Nathan asked, My lord the king, have you decided that Adonijah will be the next king and that he will sit on your throne? Today he has sacrificed many cattle, fattened calves, and sheep, and he has invited all the king's sons to attend the celebration. He also invited the commanders of the army and Abiathar the priest. They are feasting and drinking with him and shouting, Long live king Adonijah. But he did not invite me or Zadok the priest or Benaiah or your servant Solomon. Has my lord the king really done this without letting any of his officials know who should be the next king? And so here we have this uncertainty, you know, and, um, you know, it, so the, the uncertainty in this case leads to division. And then you have uh, someone assert themselves and then you have um, this confusion and this chaos that falls down. And, uh, you know, Adonijah is trying to... Um, He's trying to give legitimacy to his bid to become the king by a sacrificing cattle. He, he's got the priest there, you know, so it's like there's the religious side. You remember back when um, God told uh, King Saul, I'm taking away, uh, he told him through the prophet Samuel, I'm taking away the kingdom from you. And um, Saul begged and pleaded, please return with me, Samuel, and, and uh, so that I can sacrifice, make sacrifices to the Lord your God. And um, Samuel's like, no, I'm not going to do that. At first, Samuel said, no, we're not going to do that. And then finally, Samuel said, okay, fine, I'll go with you. Why is that key? It's key because the king is able to, in front of everybody, he gets the public endorsement of the priest and, and make sacrifices to God. So you have that religious aspect of support. And um, that's, so that's why Adonijah is doing this. So verse 28, King David responded, call Bathsheba. So she came back in and stood before the king. And the king repeated this vow, 
As surely as the Lord lives, who has rescued me from every danger, your son Solomon will be the next king and will sit on my throne this very day, just as I vowed to you before the Lord, the God of Israel. So some people might say, well, uh, it's this whole conspiracy thing and Nathan is, is really just kind of finagling some things to, to try to... No, actually what Nathan is doing, he is acting on the previously established word of the king. The king has previously vowed Solomon will be the next king. And so what Nathan is doing is he's asking David to reaffirm the word that was spoken. A word can be reaffirmed. And so it's very important. Uh, God, God does that. You can see the same thing happen with all the messianic prophecies. With every messianic prophecy that God gives, he is reaffirming what he is going to do through Jesus. And he, he, he speaks it again in a different way. He's reaffirming it. He speaks it out in a, a different way, and he's reaffirming it. And all the types and shadows that you see in Scripture, um, they, you put them all together, and they, um, they confirm and they sort of shape uh, the profile of the person of Jesus, so much so that Jesus expected everyone to recognize him when he came. And so what David is doing now is he's reaffirming this word that he spoke before. And so, uh, verse 31, Then Bathsheba bowed down with her face to the ground before the king and exclaimed, May my lord King David live forever. Then King David ordered, Call Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah son of Jehoiada. When they came into the king's presence, the king said to them, Take Solomon and my officials down to Gihon Spring. Solomon is to ride on my own mule. There Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet are to anoint him king over Israel. Blow the ram's horn and shout, Long live King Solomon. Then escort him back here, and he will sit on my throne. He will succeed me as king, for I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and Judah. And uh, so, you know, he says, take him down to Gihon Spring. Gihon means to, to uh, you know, like gush forth. It, it's, uh, but you notice also that Adonijah also sacrificed at a spring. And the spring then is just uh, symbolic of that, um, that, that wellspring, if you will, you know, like a like a, a gushing forth, a, a new a new thing bursting forth, and uh, and so it's it, it, why they do it that way. Well, this is before the the temple has been built, and after the temple's built, then the king has a special place that he stands by the by a pillar, but uh, before then, it's it's done at the spring. Verse thirty six. Amen, Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, replied. May the Lord, the God of my lord, the king, decree that it happen. And may the Lord be with Solomon as he has been with you, my lord, the king. And may he make Solomon's reign even greater than yours. So Zedek the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, and the king's bodyguard took Solomon down to Gihon Spring, with Solomon riding on King David's own mule. There Zedek the priest took the flask of olive oil from the sacred tent and anointed Solomon with the oil. Then they sounded the ram's horn, and all the people shouted, Long live King Solomon! And all the people followed Solomon into Jerusalem, playing flutes and shouting for joy. The celebration was so joyous and noisy that the earth shook with the sound. So it's a different kind of celebration. It's a, This is like um, like a, a, a God-supported type of celebration, you know, where the people are in joyful unison because this is, this is right, and this is, this is what they know the, that the king's they know the king's will is in this and so whereas adonijah had to really work hard to getting his feast going and getting all the people to come and you know uh shunning some people all of the people are invited to this and they're all they're all just um extremely joyful and jubilant and they should be verse 41 adonijah and his guests heard the celebration and shouting just as they were finishing their banquet when Joab heard the sound of the ram's horn, he asked, What's going on? Why is the city in such an uproar? And while he was still speaking, Jonathan, son of Abiathar, the priest, arrived. Come in, Adonijah said to him, for you are a good man. You must have good news. Not at all, Jonathan replied. Our lord King David has just declared Solomon king. The king sent him down to Gihon Spring with Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, protected by the king's bodyguard. They had him ride on the king's own mule, and Zadok and Nathan have anointed him at Gihon Spring as the new king. They have just returned, and the whole city is celebrating and rejoicing. That's what all the noise is about. What's more, Solomon is now sitting on the royal throne as king, and all the royal officials have gone to King David and congratulated him, saying, May your God make Solomon's fame even greater than your own, and may Solomon's reign be even greater than yours. Then the king bowed his head in worship as he lay on his bed, 
And he said, Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, who today has chosen a successor to sit on my throne while I am still alive to see it. Then all of Adonijah's guests jumped up in panic from the banquet table and quickly scattered. Just like, you know, just like when a light comes on and the cockroaches, <laughs> cockroaches scatter. Adonijah was afraid of Solomon. This is verse 50. So he rushed to the sacred tent and grabbed onto the horns of the altar. Word soon reached Solomon that Adonijah had seized the horns of the altar in fear and that he was pleading, Let King Solomon swear today that he will not kill me. Solomon replied, If he proves himself to be loyal, not a hair on his head will be touched. But if he makes trouble, he will die. So King Solomon summoned Adonijah, and they brought him down from the altar. He came and bowed respectfully before King Solomon, who dismissed him, saying, Go on home. And, you know, I, I, I love this because this is, this is someone who just... It's it's a conspiracy to take. <laughs> anyway, uh, they they if they have this uh, they have this exchange because the this guy has just tried to usurp the throne from Solomon and Solomon is now established on the throne and I mean in times past or you I mean you can see in history that many kings would just say you know off with his head because it's like you know why why leave a possible contender for the throne in place you know and let him but but Solomon's like if if he proves himself loyal he's he can he'll live it's fine so when he comes to see Solomon Solomon's like go on home but so it's like this it's a it's a dismissal but it's a it's a merciful dismissal dismissal and so like you have this reminds me of um in the New Testament with Jesus and the and the woman who's who's uh, um, accused of this of this terrible uh, sin, you know, and it's in the middle of Jesus preaching. They bring her in, and he's and he's in the middle of teaching, and they interrupt him, and they're like, you know, this woman was caught in an act that that declares that she should be stoned, you know, and um, and you, you know, if you remember this, what happened, Jesus uh, ends up, you know, uh, he writes in the sand, you know, and then and then he says he, he was without sin. Let them. Th- throw a stone at her first and they all leave and he asked the woman is no one here to condemn you and she said no one lord and he said neither do i can condemn you he said go and sin no more and so it's basically the same thing go and sin no more yeah adonijah i know that you tried to steal my throne but if if from now on if you do okay then you won't have a problem you know so he's like go on home it's like go and sin no more so chapter two as the time of king david's death approached he gave this charge to his son solomon I am going where everyone on earth must someday go. Take courage and be a man. Observe the requirements of the Lord your God and follow all his ways. Keep the decrees, commands, regulations, and laws written in the law of Moses, so that you will be successful in all you do and wherever you go. If you do this, then the Lord will keep the promise he made to me. He told me, if your descendants live as they should and follow me faithfully with all their heart and soul, one of them will always sit on the throne of Israel. And there is something else. You know what? Uh, sorry. You know what Joab, son of Zariah, did to me when he murdered my two army commanders, Abner, son of Ner, and Amasa, son of Jether. He pretended that it was an act of war, but it was done in a time of peace, staining his belt and sandals with innocent blood. Do with him what you think best, but don't let him grow old and go down to his grave in peace. Go, oh, excuse me, and go to his grave in peace. Verse 7. Be kind to the sons of Barzillai of Gilead. Make them permanent guests at your table, for they took care of me when I fled from your brother Absalom. And remember Shimei, son of Gera, the man from Bahirim and Benjamin. He cursed me with a terrible curse as I was fleeing to Mahanaim. When he came down to meet me at the Jordan River, I swore by the Lord that I would not kill him. But that oath does not make him innocent. You are a wise man, and you will know how to arrange uh, a proper execution for him. And that's where I changed the words a little bit there. <laughs> Verse 10, Then David died and was buried with his ancestors in the city of David. David had reigned over Israel for forty years, seven of them in Hebron and thirty-three in Jerusalem. Solomon became king and sat on the throne of his of David his father, and his kingdom was firmly established. <clears throat> and so David's, you know, you see this, this thing, this happens uh, whenever there is a changing of the guard, so to speak, whenever there is, uh, whenever someone in the word realizes that they're about to die, they... Tell the next person, they tell them, these are some things you need to do. These are some things you need to know after I'm gone. And these are some things you need to take care of. And so David is telling him, there's some unfinished business that needs to be seen to. 
and uh, you know he's like you're a wise man you'll you know you'll 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 be able to figure it out, <laughs> and then uh, that's the end of it. And so uh, David's or Solomon's kingdom is firmly established, but there's some things that are going to firm or are, are going to even more firmly establish it as we go on. So verse thirteen, one day Adonijah, and this is the guy who just tried to take the kingdom and failed, and 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 Solomon said, you know, go on home. Thank you. One day Adonijah, whose mother was Haggith, came to see Bathsheba, Solomon's mother. Have you come with peaceful intentions? she asked him. Yes, he said, I come in peace. In fact, I have a favor to ask of you. What is it? she asked. He replied, as you know, the kingdom was rightfully mine. All Israel wanted me to be the next king. But the tables were turned, and, saw, and the kingdom went to my brother instead, for that is the way the Lord wanted it. So now I have just one favor to ask of you. Please don't turn me down. So what's his attitude? His attitude is, look, I had the whole kingdom, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, I lost it, and that's fine, but I should still get something. It's kind of where he's at. It's like, I should get something, kind of, kind of how he's acting. Uh, what is it, she asked, verse 17. He replied, speak to King Solomon on my behalf, for I know he will do anything you request. Ask him to let me marry Abishag, the girl from Shunem. All right, Bathsheba replied, I will speak to the king for you. So Bathsheba went to King Solomon to speak on Adonijah's behalf. The king rose from his throne to meet her, and he bowed down before her. When he sat down on his throne again, the king ordered that the throne be brought in for his mother, and she sat at his right hand. I have one small request to make of you, she said. I hope you won't turn me down. What is it, my mother? he asked. You know I won't refuse you. Then let your brother Adonijah marry Abishag, the girl from Shunem, she replied. Hey, now, before we look at Solomon's reply, you got to remember, Abishag is the girl who was found to take care of King David in his old age. She was, um, she was to keep him warm. She was to take care of his needs and, and uh, be his caregiver. Um, and uh, although, again, there was, the Bible says there was no romantic tie, she was not a wife. She was just there to take care of him. And so it's like, why would he ask for, why ask for this woman? Why ask for her? Um, and so, verse 22, Solomon replies, How can you possibly ask me to give Abishag to Adonijah? King Solomon demanded. You might as well ask me to give him the kingdom. You know that he is my older brother, and that he has Abiathar the priest and Joab son of Zariah on his side. Then King Solomon made a vow before the Lord, May God strike me and even kill me if Adonijah has not sealed his fate with this request. The Lord has confirmed me and placed me on the throne of my father David. He has established my dynasty as he promised, so as surely as the Lord lives, Adonijah will die this very day. So King Solomon ordered Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, to execute him, and Adonijah was put to death. And so, um, as many people might look at this and say, what, I mean, why would Solomon react uh, this way? Like, it's kind of, we might see that as kind of an overreaction. But if you, you need to understand, you need to look at it you know, not only at the t from the time that they're living in, because here's a time gap thing, but but there's also a, the the cultural side of it. But there's also, uh, I mean, we can understand this even in our culture. You know, if someone um, someone tried to take something that your your mother or father, or someone very dear to you, gave you, they tried to take it from you, because David had given the kingdom to Solomon, said it's Solomon's kingdom, it's going to be Solomon's kingdom, and Adonijah tried to take it. So first of all, you know, someone takes that thing, tries to take that thing from you, and then and then it's found out, you challenge them on it, you call them on it, and so they back off, but then they ask for some, I mean, you know, it's, it's like Adonijah should understand, you know, once you've fallen out of favor, you don't, you, there's just certain things you don't ask for, you know, you just, it's just not wise. It's just very ill-advised to do this, you know, and it's like, why, why that? You know, it would be like, um, if, if, a uh, uh, like a young girl, you know, did something to really upset her mother and then she came and said, I'd like to borrow one of your dresses after she's just gotten forgiveness. She's just gotten forgiveness. Goes and asks, I'd like to borrow one of your dresses for prom. Oh, and by the way, I'd like to borrow your wedding dress. You know, it's something that it's just it's 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 just out of it's out of bounds. It's not it's it's not appropriate to ask for that. You know, and that's exactly what Ad, what Adonijah has done. And so, and from Solomon's perspective, it's like, why not just give him the kingdom? Just you know, I just just give him give him everything. And he's made a point here too. The commander of the army's on his side, and so is the priest. 
you know, um, and those people, those guys were under the same, basically under the same word of protection that Solomon had extended to Adonijah. As long as he shows himself loyal, he doesn't, if, as long as he doesn't cause problems in the kingdom, he can live. You know, but now uh, this word has now been defied. So he's no longer under that protection. So um, let's do verse 25, because I'm not sure if we read that far yet. So King Solomon ordered Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, to execute him, and Adonijah was put to death. Then the king said to Abiathar the priest, Go back to your home in Anathoth. You deserve to die. But I will not kill you now, because you carried the ark of the sovereign Lord for David, my father, and you shared all his hardships. So Solomon deposed Abiathar from his position as priest of the Lord, thereby fulfilling the prophecy the Lord had given at Shiloh concerning the descendants of Eli. And so it's kind of like all is well that ends well. You know, that prophecy had been made way back, you know, um, when Samuel was still a boy, that that, uh, he, that that family would lose the priesthood. And so... Whether Solomon knew it or not, he's now fulfilled a word of the Lord that was spoken way back by, by, uh, by Samuel. Verse 28, Joab had not joined Absalom's re earlier rebellion, but he had joined Adonijah's rebellion. So when Joab heard about Adonijah's death, he ran to the sacred tent of the Lord and grabbed onto the horns of the altar. When this was reported to King Solomon, he sent Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, to execute him. Benaiah went to the sacred tent of the Lord and said to Joab, The king orders you to come out. But Joab answered, No, I will die here. So Benaiah returned to the king and told him what Joab had said. Do as he said, the king replied. Kill him there beside the altar and bury him. This will remove the guilt of Joab's senseless murders from me and from my father's family. The Lord will repay him for the murders of two men who were more righteous and better than he. For my father knew nothing about the deaths of Abner son of Ner, the commander of the army of Israel, and of Amasa son of Jether, commander of the army of Judah. May their blood be on Joab and on his, and his descendants forever, and may the Lord grant peace forever to David, his descendants, his dynasty, and his throne. So Benaiah son of Jehoiada returned to the sacred tent and executed Joab, and he was buried at his home in the wilderness. Then the king appointed Benaiah to command the army in place of Joab, and he installed Zadok the priest to take the place of Abiathar. So, so here is, uh, you know, again, we might look at this and say, wow, that's really harsh. Well, God had previously talked about uh, murder and said an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Now, Jesus quoted the very same um, scripture, uh, but what Jesus did is he said, you've heard it said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, love your enemies. And so what Jesus did is he said, now we are, now that I am fulfilling the law, I am altering this command. And so at this time, though, the eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth was still in place. Joab knew full well what he was doing. And because it took place at the altar, it has to do with that. Without the, the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. But in this case, it's about, it's about Solomon saying, my family is innocent of this. This is what Joab did. And so it's like Joab needs to own up to what he has done. So verse 36, then king, the, the, the king then sent for Shimei. And told him, build a house here, and this is the guy, the guy that called down curses on David, you know, when he was fleeing for his life to Mahanaim. The king then sent for Shimei and told him, build a house here in Jerusalem and live there. But don't step outside the city to go anywhere else. On the day you so much as cross the Kidron Valley, you will surely die, and your blood will be on your own head. In other words, it will be your fault. I'm, I'm, he, in other words, he's giving this guy Shimei, even though he deserves to be executed. He's saying, you can live here in the city under my protection, but don't don't leave the city, is what he's saying. It'll be your fault if, if you do, is what he's saying. Verse 38, Shimei replied, your sentence is fair. I will do whatever my lord the king commands. So Shimei lived in Jerusalem for a long time. But three years later, two of Shimei's slaves ran away to King Ashish, son of Maacah of Gath. When Shimei learned where they were, he saddled his donkey and went to Gath to search for them. When he found them, he brought them back to Jerusalem. Solomon heard that Shimei had left Jerusalem and had gone to Gath and returned. So the king sent for Shimei and demanded, Didn't I make you swear by the Lord and warn you not to go anywhere else or you would surely die? And you replied, The sentence is fair. I will do as you say. Then why haven't you kept your oath to the Lord and obeyed my command? The king also said to Shimei, You certainly remember all the wicked things you did to my father David. May the Lord now bring that evil on your own head. But may I, King Solomon, receive the Lord's blessings. And may one of David's descendants always sit on his throne in the presence of the Lord. 
Then at the king's command, Benaiah son of Jehoiada took Shimei outside and executed him. So the kingdom was now firmly in Solomon's grip. And so, you know, it kind of goes that way. You know, whenever you take over a new thing, you always end up having to tie up some loose ends from the, the left behind by the person before you. And it's good to ask the Lord's wisdom in doing that. And, um, you know, we see God's blessing fall on Solomon. Um, you know, it is Old uh, Covenant times, and Solomon is the king. It is his call. So, uh, you know, it's just like with the priest. We say, well, how can he sentence the priest? Well, how can he send the priest and banish the priest? Well, the priest shouldn't have stepped over into civil affairs by supporting someone to become the king who wasn't the rightful king. And so because he stepped over into civil affairs, now he was judged by the civil court, and that is run by the king. And so he's like, you're banished. You know, he's like, I could execute you, but no, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to banish you. So, you know, you see that there is some mercy in Solomon's reign. So um, let's go ahead and pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your wisdom. I ask, Lord, that you'd help us all to have a deeper understanding of, of these things, Lord, and understand that not everyone who, who was sitting on the throne always did according to what your will was, Lord God. So help us to understand, um, you know, when they acted rightly and when they did not. And I thank you, Father, and in Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Well, bless you guys, and we will see you again.